Well, good evening and welcome to the Tuckahoe Town Meeting for May 26, 2022. We have a, a great information to share with you this evening. You might want to take notes, but if you don't want to take notes, this will be available to view. It is being recorded. It will be able to be viewed on YouTube, um, which if you go to the YouTube site and you type in Henrico County Tuckahoe Town Meetings, you'll you can scroll down and figure out which one it is and you can watch it again and get or you can scroll through it and get information you may want. So our topic today is FOIA request, the Freedom of Information Act and the Henrico County Internship Program. We are in person and virtual both. Uh, and if you would like to ask a question and you are here in the room, you please move over to the, the microphone there or raise your hand and I'll hand you the microphone because we want it to be recorded. You know, it isn't recorded unless you can talk into the microphone. And if you are online, please look at your screen and on the right side of the screen, there is a chat function. You can either write your question down there and Victoria Davis, who is with us this evening and, and is following and is the technician, she will give me your question. If you want to ask it in person, she can put you on, on the speaker and we can hear your question. And if for whatever reason you can't get to any of those functions, please email me, pob at patobannon.com. That's pob at P-A-T-O-B-A-N-N-O-N.com. Now we have two really good speakers, but before we begin, I also want to let everybody know we have our community officer here, Scott Phillips. He's in the room here with us. Thank you for being here, and we really appreciate that. Um, and we have our others. One of our speakers is here in person, and one is appearing virtually. So this is something new that we have not done before, but other supervisors have. Um, so we're going to be using um, a little bit of uh, camera changes, but everyone in the room, of course, has the ability to um, ask questions in person, and everybody can have their questions answered, though. Megan Ryan is our first speecher, speaker. <laughs> She is the executive director of the Virginia Coalition for Open Government. She has worked for the Virginia Coalition for Open Government since 1998 and became its executive director in 2008. Before that, she served as an opinions editor for Texas Lawyer, a newspaper in Dallas, and as a freelance writer for Andrevet Legal Media in Dallas and the National Law Journal in New York. And she has worked as an adjunct professor of media law at Hampton University's Journalism School. She first became interested in open government as a FOIA intern at the Reporters Committee for Freedom of, Freedom of the Press during law school. Her law degree is from the University of Colorado in Boulder, and she was a radio, television, and motion picture major at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. She lives in Williamsburg with her husband and teenage son. Our second speaker, just to give the first part of a brief part of her uh, vitae, Carrie Tretina is the chief of staff and um, was appointed chief of staff to the county manager in October 2019. Ultimately, she assists with the day-to-day -day management of the county's operations. Ms. Tretina works with the county manager on a range of social special projects, including research and data analysis and long-term planning efforts. And she collaborates with the Board of Supervisors, department heads, and other officials on issues impacting the interests and operations of the county. She also serves as a liaison to the county administration with the public, with elected other elected officials uh, in the region, regional partners, and other governmental agencies. She will be coming to us uh, alive, but virtually, and um, I'll give the rest of her introduction at that time. So first we begin with Megan Ryan. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, I didn't get a chance to, um, in the first presentation, to say hello to Carrie, because um, I remember when I remember when uh, the legislation was passed to first require the 
um, naming of FOIA officers and Carrie immediately uh, contacted me and introduced herself. So she has um, always been eager and diligent and ready to do her job. So you're very lucky. Um, so hello, um, my name, as uh, Pat just said, is Megan Rhine, and um, she gave all the um, uh, boring details about who I am, about my, uh, my work career up to this point. I've pretty much been working in the area of Freedom of Information Act for all of my professional career um, in some way or another. Um, there have been a few few gaps here and there, but for the most part, this has been my entire professional career. And so I wanted to tell you a little story about why this, uh, this issue seems to resonate with me, because I think it just fits in um, with my personality. And when we're talking about, because what we're talking about is access to information. And um, my kind of just general philosophy is that you, um, if you're, right, if you make getting information easy, if you share information regularly, then you're building a lot of trust with the citizens. And the citizens, in return, they know that if you, if and when there is a controversy or there has been information withheld from them, they've got a whole wealth of information about you to go back to, to say, you know, okay, uh, you messed up this time. But um, I know that you, you know, that was a mistake. That's an anomaly. And um, so the story that I, that I tell is about when I was in the 10th grade and my, my friend, Anne, who I was just friendly with, but not good friends with, um, she and I were supposed to go to a party together. It turns out she couldn't go. I went and for some unknown reason decided I needed to kiss her boyfriend. And so I did. <laughs> and the next day I was a uh, very, uh, racked with guilt that, oh my gosh, what did I do? So I called Anne right away and I said, uh, you know, sorry you couldn't make it to the party. Oh, by the way, I guess you already heard what happened. And she said, yes, I did, uh, but why don't you tell me in your own words? Well, she was totally suckering me. She, had, she didn't know. She was tricking me into telling her, but I had all intentions to tell her anyway. And so I told her, I said, this is what happened and I'm really sorry and well, I don't know what, what the problem was. So two things happened from that, uh, that interaction. First one was her boyfriend and all of his friends who were very popular at the school, they shunned me. For the whole rest of the school, Megan was persona non grata, they didn't like me. Um, you know, then that stopped, then they graduated and who cared. But the other part of that was that Anne uh, became my best friend. And, and she still is my best friend. She lives actually not very far from here. And we uh, stay in touch uh, quite a bit. And I think the reason why that happened is because she, uh, I, I told her, I just told her. I didn't try to hide it from her. I didn't try to sugarcoat it. I didn't know how she was gonna react. Um, but I just needed to tell her because I thought it was the right thing to do. And I think that that built up trust that she knew that I would be honest with her was important to her. And it is remained important to our relationship to this day. I know that if I straight, I'm going to go to Anne and she will tell it to me straight. And so I just think not only is it kind of the right thing to do, but I also think that trying to withhold information from people, trying to manage um, you know, what is released and what is not released, what is said, what's not is said, that just takes too much energy for my, for my taste. I just don't have that kind of wherewithal to do all the planning that goes into keeping information uh, confidential. So that's why I think I'm drawn to this particular issue of the Freedom of Information Act. Freedom of Information Act in Virginia was enacted in 1968 and it presents a pathway for citizens to gain access to the records and meetings of government. We're not gonna talk about meetings today, we're only gonna talk about access to records. It, um, we have this uh, because, uh, as, as Madison said, that in order to be um, our own governors, we need to arm ourselves with the power that knowledge gives. And that knowledge is the information about what, the, what our government is doing. 
Um, it is, you know, if we are to be government of the people and by the people and for the people, then the people need to be able to see the information that is being generated in their name. Um, and this is not because we necessarily mistrust anyone, but it is like Reagan made famous, um, trust but verify. Sure, I'm okay with what you're doing, but I still just, I need a little more information about it to be totally comfortable about it. Or I don't understand what happened. I'd like to understand what happened. Or just like, you know, just, just checking in, just wanted to see how things are going and things seem to be going a-okay. So it gives, that, it gives citizens that power. The Freedom of Information Act in Virginia is preceded by a policy statement, and it's a pretty strong statement. Unlike most statutes in the Code of Virginia, they don't have a policy statement. They just, you know, here's the law, one, two, three. FOIA starts out by saying, among other things, that the public is to be at all times the beneficiary of any action taken at any level of government. So that policy statement is supposed to govern the way that the whole rest of the statute is interpreted and applied. Its provisions are to be construed in ways that promote access to information, uh, to promote and to afford every opportunity to citizens to witness the operations of government. So if you start from that basic premise, then hopefully you'll embrace um, the rest of the act to understand that when you should release records, you should be to do it. If you don't have to release them, you can think about maybe is it really necessary to, to withhold them or is it okay to trust our citizens with this information? When we talk about access to information, we talk a lot about the word transparency. And um, I've always heard, you know, I, that, that Transparency, I'm doing this to be transparent, and that's always good. What I usually mean by transparency might be a little bit different, though, by what government means by transparency. Transparency is the proactive disclosure of information, and that is good. Should you know, don't, don't, don't think that I don't think that proactive disclosure is good. They have decided, here's some information we have, and we bet you citizens would like to see this, and we're gonna put it on our websites or we're gonna tell you, and that, that is, that, that's all really great, and it should, it, that should always be part of um, any uh, open government, any transparent government. What I mean when I talk about transparency, though, includes what we as citizens decide is important and get information on. So maybe you or I or uh, Ms. O'Bannon here, we have different things that, that spark our interest, that we really care about. And we should be able to decide what those things are and then go to our government and say, and what can you tell me about that? That to me is what true transparency is, is when no matter what we as citizens have decided is important to us that the government is doing, we should be able to have some measure of access and understanding to what's going on. When we look at records, um, and, and FOIA presents that, that pathway for us to get that information, and when you get the information, your, your reaction may be different from your neighbor's reaction. So even if we're three, let's say all of us in this room are interested in the same topic. We ask for some records related to it, we get it, we all read the same words on the page, but we might have different um, reactions to it we might say, hey, yeah, I think that's great, and I hope they keep doing that. Or you might say, no, uh, I don't approve of that, and I'd like, to, I'd like to find out how I can stop that. Or it could just be neutral, or you're unsure, maybe you need some more information, maybe you actually don't care after all. But the, so the records themselves, they're kind of, they're neutral, they're just words on a page. It's what citizens bring to the table when they look at this information it's for them to decide whether or not that aligns with their values or whether it runs counter to their values. And when I'm talking about citizens here, I am talking very broadly. We're not talking about immigration status or anything. Um, and even though Virginia does have a quirk in it that talks about it's only for Virginia citizens, 
um, what I'm talking, what I mean here when I say citizens is anybody in Virginia who wants to request what, records. Citizens, reporters, genealogists, historians, uh, advocates, government employees when they go home and decide that they want more information about something. You know, everybody in the Commonwealth is a citizen for purposes of, um, of requesting records, their right to request records under FOIA. Now, when you start getting into the business of Freedom of Information Act requests, you'll get into uh, several stereotypes. And one of them is the gadfly, and she just wants to stir up trouble. She just wants to, uh, you know, catch the government in a lie or prove that, you know, there's been something nefarious going on. And those people do exist. That's why stereotypes exist, because there is that grain of truth to them. And I have a lot of them call me, and they're convinced that there's a conspiracy behind every statement, every email that they, every phone call that they have with their government. And they just are. But by and large, they are far and few between. Most everybody else is pretty reasonable. On the other hand, you have a stereotype of the government employee who is very suspicious of you and wants to do anything and everything they can to thwart you and to intimidate you into not getting information. Those people exist too. In fact, I just, <laughs> in the break from the one o'clock to the six o'clock uh, meeting, I just got one um, where there's some cat and mouse going on, not in the records component, but in a meeting setting where uh, this public body is meeting at places they're not telling people where they're meeting. Um, and when someone found out anyway, she got there and the door was locked and they wouldn't let her in. So there are, are luckily, they are far and few between, but they exist too. There's also a stereotype. Um, during the General Assembly session, I am a lobbyist for uh, the Coalition for Open Government, and I lobby on behalf of um, access to records. <laughs> Shock. <laughs> and, um, every year, I have Republicans tell me that they are the party of transparency and the Democrats are anti. And every year, I have Democrats tell me that they are the party of transparency and the Republicans are anti. And they're both wrong. <laughs> they're both right. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It, it, I wish, in some ways, I wish it was a partisan issue because then it would make it easier for me in the lobbying sphere to be able to say, okay, well, I'm going to concentrate on this party or uh, ignore that party, but it doesn't work that way. It really has to do with people's comfort level with releasing information. And some people are much more wary and leery and scared of do it, of releasing information and others are much more open to it and figuring out who those people are every year is always one of my favorite things <laughs> not really um but then they, and then i do get someone and then they like um uh, the the <laughs> delegate o'bannon and he was a good a good uh pretty solid vote for transparency and then he was not there anymore and i had to start over with the people who were there. So it's a, it's a tough, it's a tough show sometimes. What is happening when we are talking about whether or not there is access to records and whether you as a citizen are going to have um, access to it is um, we are balancing interests. We've gone over many of the citizens' interests. You know, these are the decisions that impact us. We want to know how our tax dollars are spent. We want to have a mechanism that, you know, some sort of mechanism that helps us figure out if there might be a little corruption going on or some just maybe not corruption, but some conflicts going on. Um, and we want to make sure that laws are being applied fairly. Um, if there's a program, if there's an application program, if there's a license, we want to make sure the people who are licensed are meeting the qualifications. Um, and the people who met the qualifications that they're getting the license um, or permit like they're supposed to be. The government, of course, has their own interests and they're very important interests. And um, I would never say that they aren't. Um, sometimes you're trying to protect public funds 
Um, you don't want to um, reveal too quickly that you're interested in buying a parcel of property because the property owner might get wind of it and jack the price up. But that would hurt taxpayers to have to pay more. If you're in the no in negotiations over that piece of that sale, that piece of property, maybe you don't want the your bottom line to be revealed because again, they could try to take advantage of that. Um, public safety is very important too. You don't want um, some uh, a prisoner's uh, family member to get a diagram of the prison that shows all the secret passages and exits because the family members or the prisoner may be able to exploit that and escape. We don't want lawyer to have lawyers to have to reveal the advice that they give to their clients, their their um, government clients. Uh, doctor, if there's a uh, you know like VCU uh, a VC doctor shouldn't have to tell uh, what they've advice they've given to a patient. Um, and we're also talking about proprietary interests of business. You know, businesses contract with government on a lot of different things, and sometimes they have to share. Uh, information about their businesses to make sure that they're a good risk for the government, but uh, you don't want necessarily that they don't want that information to get out to their competitors. So maybe your maybe government would not want to release records about those businesses. And then there's the protection of personal privacy that if this information was released that it could harm somebody um, and not just. We're not talking about your name or your address because we, you know, those are not private. That's not private information. People can see us walk into our houses and we get called by our names all the time. We're talking about your financial information, your medical information, you know, whether you've used government services like um, social services, whether the child protective services has been called on you or something like that. Those, those kinds of uh, personal privacy issues um, are protected as well. We're always trying to find that balance. When is it appropriate? to withhold a record to protect one of these interests, when is it really not um, threatened and, real, and the public should be able to see that information. So if you want to make a FOIA request, first of all, we have to decide what a public record is, and then number two, what is it that you would do as a citizen, and then the number three is what does the government do when it gets your request. So a public record is defined in the Freedom of Information Act as those things that are prepared or owned by or in the possession of a public body or its officers, employees, or agents in the transaction of public business. So first of all, when we talk about, you know, I say those uh, records or those things, I mean, it's anything. It's anything the government's doing. Um, it's email and reports and photos and videos and, um, you know, microfilm. You know, any format, it doesn't matter the format. What matters, the key phrase is public business. Is that record about public business? And it's not defined in the code, but public business is pretty much everything the government does, right? That's what, I mean, the government business is the public's business. So while they are conducting public services and, 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 and statutory um, requirements of things that they are required to do by law, all the records that they're using and generating and keeping while they're doing that, those are all public records. And FOIA says you can ask for any public record. You're not necessarily going to get anything you ask for or every public record you ask for. We'll get to that in a second. But it does mean that all of those records are at least sort of in the field of play. Here they all are, and you can ask for them, and then we'll figure out which ones have to be released, which ones might not be uh, released to you. And again, it doesn't matter when we focus on the, the content, the public business portion of it, it ultimately doesn't matter where those records started from or ended up. So just as it wouldn't matter um, if I went home and used my own pencil and paper to write a report and put it in an envelope that I bought with my own money and a stamp that my husband bought, and, but I wrote a letter to my boss about a report that I, or you know, a, a project that we're working on, 
that's a public record. People don't have any, I mean, that seem, people seem to understand that that's a public record. Doesn't matter that I use Well, the same is true if you're using your personal phone. If you're using your own phone, your own iPad, your own Gmail account, if you're writing about public business, it's a public record. And the flip side of that is that you may be at work using your .gov email address or your, your government-issued iPad, but if you're writing to your doctor to confirm a, an appointment or sending your son a picture of, a, of the cat, that's not public business and it's not a public record, even though it's on your work computer. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so my question is, are the records, uh, financial records of public servants, something that can be requested under FOIA? Uh, yes, yes, they can be. So, and what you're going to get for that is kind of dependent on what it specifically you're asking for. All elected officials have to file statements of economic interest and they are supposed to report their gifts. And those are um, considered public records that have to be released. There are some things they can redact from that, but generally they are supposed to be available. Um, and there's a specific statute that deals with um, uh, statements of economic interest. On the other hand, if you have a, a member of the Board of Supervisors who goes on a conference, goes to a conference and they spend money on a hotel, and transportation, they go out to eat, and they submit uh, invoices or receipts to the public body to get reimbursed. Those most definitely are public records that need to be released upon request. So what do you do in order to invoke the Freedom of Information Act? Well, really, all the statute says is that you have to describe the record with reasonable specificity. That's really the only thing it says. It doesn't say anything about it being in writing or being narrow or what you want to do with it or who you are. All those things may come into play, but all FOIA requires is that it's described with reasonable specificity. And that's to give the citizen the benefit of the doubt that the citizen doesn't necessarily know what the government has or what they call it. You may say, oh, I want that report about, you know, the, the wallpaper at the, at the library. Uh, and they're like, oh, well, I don't know about that report, but we do have this form 60374. But what would you, you wouldn't know that. That's an internal thing. And you shouldn't be expected to know exactly what it's called or how it's managed. So just describe it enough so that when the government gets it, they can go, oh, okay, either I understand what they're trying to get or if I don't understand, I need to get on the phone and ask this person for clarification so we can be on the same page. And that's why it also is good to be, to put your request in writing, even though I just said, get on the phone. I just mean that you both have something to go back to, um, you know, along the way that says, this is what I asked for on this date. Um, and this was your response. Um, I do have um, a guy who calls me pretty frequently he gets on the phone a lot, and then he sends an email and says, this email is to memorialize the phone call we just had and say, so, you know, all the stuff that they talked about so that he can go back to it and said, you said in the phone call, um, you know, this is what we were going to do. Um, so, and just on the, this thing about duty to narrow your request, technically you could ask for everything that the government has. And there was such a request in Seattle a couple of five, six, seven years ago. Um, I don't know what the person was trying, what point the person was trying to make, but they asked for every record that the government had. So um, you could, but it would bring the government to a standstill. It would cost you $50,000 billion and it would, you know, what's the point? So. No, you don't have a duty to narrow your request, but it's going to help you. It's going to help the government get you what you 
if you go too broad, you're not only is it going to take longer and probably cost more, but you're also probably going to get a lot of stuff you don't want. The uh, and the example I'm the second time I've given this example, but a guy, an attorney in Chesapeake, was interested in a development about I think it was Galaxy of Golf, and so he asked for all emails related to keyword Galaxy Golf, Galaxy of Golf. So those three. Well, he gets an estimate. They go, okay, well <laughs> we've got your request. It's going to cost like a million dollars like literally a million dollars and he's floored, you know, <laughs> what's going on? Well, the, the program, you know, they had to write a, a, an IT query to get the emails that he was looking for. And they just looked, said, okay, bring up everything that has Galaxy in it. Well, that included every email that thousands of S Chesapeake City employees had sent from their Galaxy Samsung mobile device. The word galaxy was there. And so it picked up a whole bunch of stuff that he definitely didn't want. And they understood it. They got on the phone back and forth. Let's narrow your request to be to, you know, to better search parameters so that we can um, get you what you want and not what you don't want. Um, if you don't know where to file, um, you can, you know, carry is very good about, you know, responding and it's there. If you're a citizen here, you probably know where to go and how to do it. But if you're interested in maybe something in the city of Richmond or the school system or the police department or you know a state agency, go to their website and on, the, on their front page, they are supposed to have a link to FOIA that takes you to a what's called a rights and responsibilities page that kind of outlines um, basic FOIA procedure and it's supposed to have a contact a point in that information as well. So that is a statutory requirement that they have that on their websites. So once the, once the government gets your request, what do they do? Well, they have five days, five working days to respond to you. And the working day usually starts the day after they get your request. So if it's a Friday, the work, first working day is a Monday. If, it's a, if they get it on a Monday, the first working day is a Tuesday. And it doesn't include holidays or weekends, it's working days. Gets a little tricky with school districts sometimes because they close during the Christmas break, but then some of them are actually still at work. So like, what's, is it closed or not closed? And I've seen that become a problem in the past. Um, but one of, they have five responses that they are supposed, one of five responses that they are required to give you. One is you can have all the records and here they are. And that happens a whole lot more than we, you know, than we might realize it happens. You know, I hear about all the horror stories when things go wrong, but day in and day out, so many FOIA requests are going through without a hitch, without a problem in the world. So. Please, uh, please remember that too. That it um, the second response is here are some of the records, but we're not, we're keeping others, or here are some records and we're redacting some of what's on there. And a third response is we're not going to give you any of the records. Now, if they give you the second or third response, they have to cite the law that allows them to do that. And I'm going to get to that in a little more detail in just a second. But they have to tell you in writing. They cannot just verbally tell you no. Or what I sometimes see, see is people saying, no, you can't have those because of privacy. That's not a, that's not a law. That's not a statute that allows, there's no just general privacy that allows them to do that. Um, fourth response is we don't have the records. Maybe they, you know, you think that they, those are actually school district records. And if they know who the records, who has them, they're supposed to tell you that. But if they don't know, you know, they can just say, sorry, we don't have those. Um, so they don't have to give you records that don't exist. So like you can't ask for records that they may create in the future, or you can't be asking for um, records that require them to extract information from a bunch of different sources. You know, do you have a list of this? I'd like a list of all the people who came to the meeting. 
uh, well, actually, there may be one back there, but <laughs> if there weren't, you know, you wouldn't have to create a list for that. You could, but you don't have to create it. And finally, the fifth um, response is your request is either so big or there's so much going on in the office right now that we just can't get to your request in the five working days. We need an additional seven working days to complete your request. Um, also, over the break, I just heard from someone who um, asked for a request. They got to on the fifth day and said, we need another seven days. They got to the end of the seven days and said, we still can't do it. And we want to be able to give it to you in a month. Now, technically, they, she doesn't have the person who requested the records doesn't have to agree to that timetable. You know, if you're being nice then maybe you do it, but um, that's that's kind of playing a little fast and loose with the timetables, if you ask me. Um, you can and probably will be charged. Um, FOIA says that you can charge for the actual cost of providing the records, but that cost must be reasonable. Uh, Virginia is one of only nine states that has pretty much no limits on what reasonable and what those actual costs can be. I mean, it has to be actual. You can't charge for, you know, the pet walker um, while you're at work or anything like that, or the overhead that you would pay whether you were doing FOIA requests or not. But it has no limits on who can, who does the work and who can charge for their time for, for filling your request. So that means that um, you might make a request that requires um, an IT professional who makes the equivalent of $70 an hour to write the, the query to get, the, to get all the responsive records. And then the city attorney may take all those records and review them to see if anything needs to be redacted or exempted or anything like that. And you pay, and he, he's charging $100 an hour. And then there's the clerk who's going to charge uh, $30 an hour to uh, make copies and put them in an envelope for you and things like that. So it can start to uh, build up. And that's definitely the biggest problem we're having in Virginia right now is fees have really just gotten out of control. If you saw uh, WTVR um, yesterday posted a story about a um, guy, he made a request, a reporter made a request for some records from the Virginia Fine Arts Museum, and they said, we estimate it's gonna cost you $1,200. And he's like, oh, okay, well, let me narrow my request. He thought he was narrowing his request, but something went wrong because then he got another estimate back and they said, that'll be $28,000. So, you know, if that's gonna happen, Certainly, again, there should be a phone call somewhere in there where someone is saying, you know, this is something's going wrong with your request. So let's talk about what we can do about it. Um, instead, he it ended up with some it's ending up with some bad PR for the museum that they may have been able to avoid if they had just had a conversation about about this request. Um, that I could, you know, we could talk all day about fees, um, but just uh, I think just procedurally, the thing to know is that if it is over $200, they are allowed to ask for you to pay a deposit. And that deposit can be as much as the final estimate is going, it, they expect it to be. Under $200, they are supposed to give it to you without you know, I'm demanding advance payment, although um, I did hear um, yesterday about someone who is dumb for it, I believe. They won't give her the records, even though it's only $76. Won't give it to her until she pays. Um, so, like I said, you're, they're, they're, you're not going to get everything you ask for because the government interest will outweigh the public's interest many, many times. There are 120 something exemptions in FOIA. Um, these are some of the most commonly used ones, but it's important to remember that FOIA's exemptions are all discretionary. That is, you have, they have a choice. There are times where you may want, you may choose to say, you know, that might be, that might fall under the personnel exemption but we're going to release it anyway. And it does happen. 
uh, because for various reasons, it might just help build trust. It might just help explain something. Or somebody may say, you know, I'm looking at that policy statement that says interpret these exemptions narrowly. And I think that, you know, and I, I don't, I think what I have is out is too broad. I think that would be interpreting it too broadly. Um, there's been a lot in the news uh, lately about the working papers exemption. Um, one that um, Governor Youngkin is currently using to with uh, to withhold the records of the uh, calls made to the the parent tip line about uh, divisive concepts in the classroom, and uh, he says those are his working papers. There are some news outlets that are going to court over that because they think that that's too broad of an interpretation of that section. Um, all I can say is that. Every governor since I've been doing this uh, in some way since 1998 has overused the working papers exemption. And uh, it just sort of de depends on whose ox is being gored at the time and what somebody's trying, if somebody's getting a little too close to something. Um, but yeah, it is a very, it's a, 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 a near black hole uh, once um, some governors and members of the General Assembly start using it. They start using it very broadly. Um, there is no um, general exemption for personal privacy. There are some specific personal privacy related exemptions, but there's no, like I, the example I gave earlier, you can't just say no privacy. There's no such, there's no such exemption. Um, criminal investigative records are treated separately. It's they're within FOIA, but they have their own two special sections. And those two sections are total train wrecks and they're about to be even train wreckier because there's been another um, uh, amendment that goes into effect on July 1st. It's just a really convoluted, crazily written two sets of stat, uh, two sets of sections. Mm -hmm. And so it, we, we couldn't get into it here. Um, if something goes wrong, if they don't follow the rules, um, they or if you think that they've charged you too much, or you think they've used an exemption that doesn't really apply, you have some things that you can do to try to, you know, push back a little bit, you know, including keeping a conversation going, seeking other opinions that you can go back and ask, um, ask for them to reconsider. Remember that there are places within FOIA that do encourage government and requesters to work together to come to a mutually agreeable solution. So, if someone tells you no, you don't have to take that as the final. I mean, there's you're absolutely entitled to continue this conversation to see, okay, okay if I can't get that, what can I get and how can I get it? Um, but if it gets to the point where, you know, you really, you've reached an impasse and you still feel really strongly, you can file in general district court. Usually you can do that by just file, filling out a form asking for a, a, a writ of mandamus which is a court order ordering a government official to perform a specific duty. And that's usually like turn over the record or follow the procedure. Um, you can usually do that without an attorney and people do do that and citizens have won um, that way. Uh, a little more involved is to get an, a, a lawyer and file in general district court. That takes longer, um, but it has a little, it has more heft, more weight to it. And uh, finally, you can talk to your senator or your delegate and say, you know, this didn't go right for me, and I'd like to talk to you about changing the law to see that what happened to me doesn't happen to people again in the future. If you have uh, questions, you're always welcome to call me um, or Alan Gernhart. He is the head of the Virginia Freedom of Information Advisory Council. They're part of the Division of Legislative Services and State Government. He, um, uh, he is a, a dynamo. Well, no, he's not a dynamo. He's just a, he's a workhorse. He just keeps going, plodding through all the calls that he gets. Um, he plays it very straight and narrow. Um, the difference between us is I'm a, a nonprofit and I get to be more opinionated than, than Alan does. And I get to advocate in the General Assembly. But I trust him 100% and I hope you feel free to reach out to him or to me if you have questions.
I do have one personal comment. Um, this was a few years ago. There was a zoning case that was coming before the board and it was pretty controversial. And um, my planning commissioner and I, and my current planning commissioner just left for a second, but <laughs> my planning commissioner and I would email, you know, thoughts on the zoning case back and forth. And after a couple of months, my computer just crashed. I mean, it, it, it was gone and I couldn't retrieve any information on it. And we had a request, a FOIA request. And my first response was, my computer crashed and I have none of the early emails from about the first half of the case. And of course, they thought I was lying, I guess. But I said, oh, but I always, always include copy, you know, the CC line, I copy my assistant. So she'll have everything. <laughs> and so they got all the emails and it ended up being a stack of about three inches because I know you mentioned before, I would write something, the, the planning commissioner would send back a message and it went back and forth and it was just pages. And I thought I'd take a look at it before it went out. And the very first one said, this is going to be a very difficult case. Let's be careful what we, we say because I'll bet we get foia <laughs> and we did. So that's, you know, being a government official means my life is an open book and, and you can get my finances report. If you go in, if you want to call the county, they'll mail you a copy. <laughs> and I have to do that at least once a year. I think it's by February 1st of each year and it's whatever I owned on January 1st, you know everything. So um, now we're going to hear from Carrie Tratina. Carrie is the original FOIA officer for Henrico, but you're going to learn that it's now somebody else. But she began in the county's internship program, and she's going to talk about that too. And that enabled her to gain experience with the Department of Finance in the summers of 2011, 2012, and the winter of, winter of 2013. She became a full-time member of the county staff in May 2013 joining finance as a budget analyst, and later she worked as management specialist in the county manager's office. In 27, April 2017, she joined Henrico's Division of Fire as Director of Administration, and it's a position she held until her appointment as Chief of Staff to the county manager. Mrs. Tratina earned her bachelor's degree in political science and public relations from Eastern Kentucky University, she also received a graduate certificate in public management from Virginia Commonwealth University's Wilder Graduate School. She also is a graduate of the Metro Richmond Public Safety Leadership Academy and the University of Virginia's LEAD LEAD program. Uh, Carrie is a lifelong resident of Henrico and a proud product of J.R. Tucker High School. She lives in Western Henrico with her wife and two boys but you can actually find them enjoying the county's natural beauty in Eastern Henrico. So we have Carrie, is she ready now? Yes, okay, there she is in the corner. And um, she's going to begin the community engagement priorities. And she's also going to talk about our paid inter intern program for high school. She'll talk about that high school, college students, law students, and it is a paid program. And we have some information on the back um, table back there before you leave, if you want that. Ms. Tratina, there you go. Thank you, Madam Chair, so much. And uh, just uh, good to see you again, Megan, as well. It's, uh, I was hoping to see you in person, my family. Uh, the COVID has entered our house, so just for all precautions, I figured we'd take these virtual town halls to the next level with a virtual presenter. Um, so uh, thank you for the introduction, Ms. Zobanin, and um, I, I do recall as a management specialist in the manager's office, the first time you and I were able to host the county's very first virtual town hall on YouTube, we were streaming with significantly less technology than Victoria and the public relations team is doing now. So um, it's pretty incredible how full circle things can be. And so Carrie is the one who figured out how to do this, this interactive thing with people who are either you can they can can hear this and see this and ask questions personally online. And uh, she won an award for setting this up for start for the first prize, uh, series of programs. Thank you, Carrie. Go ahead. Uh, it took a team effort and, uh, and Google helped. That's for sure. Um, 
So we can move on to the next slide, Victoria. So community engagement within the manager's office is, is a very broad topic because it, it truly is our job to serve the people. We're here because of you all and our residents and businesses and students. And so everything that we do has an engagement focus. So I'm really gonna distill it down to two areas where we have uh, a lot of programs and activity in. And uh, one is transparency, which I'll touch on many of the things that Megan uh, covered from a Henrico perspective and, and provide some practical uh, outcomes for everybody. And then we'll also talk about youth engagement, specifically around internships, which I am a product of. So we can just dive right into the transparency aspect. So first and foremost, we wanna be the first ones to give you the answer to the questions. Um, if you uh, read a news article, I hope that there will be lots of references from government officials and press releases, or you check our uh, social media accounts, which also traverse next door now as well, which if you're not familiar, is really like Facebook for neighborhoods, not just individuals. Um, we are constantly trying to ensure and be proactive in our communication and information to our residents. So I'll give one good example uh, that happened recently that kind of demonstrates the county's uh, desire to stay in front of issues, community issues. There's a chemical called PFOS. I'm not sure if uh, people in the audience or online have heard of this chemical. It's basically a plastic derivative. And out of the blue, late in October of 2021, we were contacted via the health department that the DEQ was going to send out a press release regarding the possible contamination of private wells within Eastern Henrico. And it was the first we've ever heard of it. Quite frankly, it was the first time myself and the county manager, John Patolkas, had heard of PFOS. Um, so we immediately jumped on it. We uh, assembled a team of experts internally and externally started to address the issue as quickly as possible. And we took it upon ourselves, even outside of state agencies to inform our residents and encourage them to reach out to us so we could test their wells. Um, and we educated ourselves on the, on the testing procedures as they're very, very particular and even had community officers such as Officer Phillips, if he was in the East, hang door hangers on residents' uh, front doors or back doors or mailboxes to encourage them to reach out to us so we could test their wells because it, it could be serious if there was contamination. But luckily, because of our proactive approach to communicate with the residents and be open about what we were trying to do, uh, we were able to, to narrowly focus the solutions and are happy to report that there is not a large uh, contamination or issue out in the White Oak Swamp area of PFOS. <clears throat> but there was also an interesting time throughout that where governments needed to be open with one another. So we actually found out during a town hall that Supervisor Nelson was hosting about PFOS that one of our residents was contacted almost a year and a half earlier by the Department of Defense, a federal agency, that there may or may not be PFOS in their in their waterways and uh, private wells. So just goes to show that even government sometimes need to have access to each other's information to ensure we're meeting the needs of uh, our communities. So the next proactive approach I'll show you before we talk about FOIAs ha um, has to do with general public information and our public data portal. So uh, Victoria, if you don't mind clicking on that first link for me. We, uh, when I was the FOIA officer, I was working closely with the county attorney's office and um, all of the agencies that were being impacted by the FOIA request coming through my queue. And we kind of put our heads together to think of what is gonna be the simplest and most effective manner to get this information out to the public so we're not having to wait five days. So staff isn't having to send the same email constantly. And so we came up with um, our data portal. So as you can see on the screen, this is on our uh, homepage and every department has this with it embedded in, in their website and applications. We created or tried to distill all of um, the county's information into six broad categories where if you wanna click into one of them for me, Victoria, 
um, I'll show you and just sample some of the information. So we're clicking on plans and development. That's a pretty critical one, whether you're talking about land records, which is the very first one, or all the activity occurring in our planning commission and board of zoning appeals. You have the publication date, a brief description because uh, understanding the information is always important. What file type? So the county is also trying to drive more of our information to digital formats and even geolocate them. Geospatial data is really important for many things that government does. Um, and so once you click on the data that you have, it takes you right to the source. And so um, right now the screen's trying to pull up one of our GIS geospatial features that we have right now. Um, and another aspect is you'll see, you'll see phone numbers, you'll see emails, you'll see direct contact information throughout um, our websites because it's not just about the piece of paper or the email or the map. You, there needs to be context and I'm sure there's follow up. I mean, I know when I was fully officer, we'd had strings of emails as was mentioned before. Um, going back and forth to fully understand, not necessarily the utilization of the information, right? Because that, that is not my, um, that that's not something I should care about. What I do care about is that I answer that question and that also I can empower that, that uh, requester with the information. Um, and so we have contact information for each department that's responsible for the data that you see. So we, um, we also, uh, the team decided to make sure that all of the regularly requested information, not just kind of unique or geospatial data was out there. So um, you'll find all types of, of reports. One, uh, another example I'll provide uh, it, in terms of what file type. So even though this is digital, you can still request any type of file type, even if you'd like it on a jump drive. Uh, but I do remember when I was in the budget office as a young budget analyst, I didn't understand why we would order so many boxes of 200, 300, 500 page budget books. And we'd have maybe one or two people get them and one would, would usually be in another agency. So putting this information out there has, has also have an environmental and, and cost benefit to it as well. And then... Um, there's also a general portal that we have. Uh, we don't need to display it here now, but if you're also curious as to not just the information and the data, the statistics that we produce, but also the uh, projects that we have going on, uh, which are large, typically large investments of taxpayer money, your money, um, and we want you to see the value that um, we're giving back to the community through those revenues. And so we'll have school projects, um, our solar energy projects, um, pipes, roads, uh, parks, all of that is available on our website. Oh, and, and fantastic. She's pulling it up right on the home page right here, um, that orange section or, or the section um, to the right of your screen. And like I said, it also has contact information, geospatial data, um, and all of that will also be updated uh, with the bond referendum, which I hear is a future topic for these Tuckahoe town halls. So I'll uh, transition to a bit more uh, specific area of focus in terms of transparency, and that is our police and uh, specifically crime data. So um, uh, Eric, Chief Eric English joined us uh, just a few years ago, maybe not even two years at this point, uh, but he, it feels like he's been a member of the family for, for much longer as he's been able to really produce some tangible outcomes that I think the community has been asking for uh, for many years. And one of them is transparency in terms of the data. And so if you want to take us to the crime statistics portal, police has completely transformed how they present and collect the information. Some of it has to do with state regulations that have changed, but also our own initiative of wanting to better understand the public safety activities and those um, coming in and out of the criminal justice system. So this website right here, once again, also digital, free, easy access, updated <clears throat> as frequently as possible, um, distills all of the 
police crime data into categories and also by certain demographic information, even down to magisterial district and if they're a resident of Henrico or, or not, if they are coming from outside of our community. And they have not just tabular information, but visual graphics um, that help better paint a context and a picture of it. They'll also provide, uh, provide historical data as well to give you maybe a five, 10 year trend on a particular item. And right here, we're looking at part one, um, nonviolent crimes gives you a good overview. As you can see, we've put it in pretty much any format that we can fit that um, hopefully the, the average citizen will be able to understand. Because like I said, that's really important to Henrico. We want to give you this information, not because it's a pillar of government, but because it's your information and we want to better serve you through an informed citizenry. Um, so I will pause there to see if there are any questions regarding the general county public data uh, portal or the police data to see if there's any questions online or in the audience. Are there any questions? Anyone? No, we don't have questions. So continue on. Is this to the internships? Um, I'll just make one more comment about the FOIA processes. Okay. So very good. Um, if, if you are not able to find what you're looking for, it's very specific um, or um, it has to do with correspondence um, about a particular topic, the best way is to reach the current FOIA officer for Henrico, who is a, the Assistant Director of Public Relations, Steve Nakamis. Um, I also agree with Megan. I think she said it earlier. I'm not sure if she said it today, but it's always great to have it in writing, um, even for us on, on the government side, because then we know we have it in writing when the time starts and stops and specifically what areas and formats that you're interested in. So it just helps all parties to put it in writing, but that uh, does not preclude anybody from coming in person and um, inspecting records or faxing, calling, um, any way that uh, you can reach us, we will respond accordingly. And then specifically for police, for streamlining uh, purposes, they have uh, their own section and charge just very, very nominal fees. They're one of the few agencies that do just because of the large uh, amount of requests that they get almost on a daily basis. For example, traffic records or criminal um, uh, records regarding, you know, a case that uh, is pertinent to you or your loved one. So they have a specific uh, call area that will kind of take one step removed for you, um, if you will. Uh, once again, I recommend their email address, which is on the screen, HPD FOIA requests at Henrico.us, but you can also call, come in person, um, or send it U.S. mail. And uh, just to cover the fees quickly, typically we really don't charge, like I said, just some departments that have, uh, that have a large amount of requests that come in, they're very uh, set fees, maybe five, ten dollars um, that are, are by no means recouping any uh, of the cost, but um, we we don't want it to be a burden on you all, and we certainly don't want it to be a burden on our staff. And sometimes charging just makes it a, a larger hassle. So I will um, continue on now to the second form of engagement, really focused on our youth. Talk about uh, open government. It doesn't really get much more open than asking our students to come in and question us and to help us improve our processes and outputs. So, but that's exactly what the internship program is designed to do. Uh, when the county manager was appointed in 2013, this is one of the programs that he formalized um, upon his appointment, but I will tell you, he did hire me as an intern in 2011, as you heard. Um, but since the program was uh, centralized within HR, since 2013, we've had over 500 interns across all agencies, including our other elected offices, such as circuit court clerk and Commonwealth attorney, and even the sheriff's office as well has created a pipeline through this. And um, if you look further as to what the return on investment is for these paid internships, uh, we've also hired since 2013 uh, more than 60 individuals from that program. Some of them um, were anywhere 
from a uh, career and technical special education program at Henrico County Public Schools um, to a graduate student or a medical professional that now works with our health department. It's pretty broad and uh, we really just encourage if there is any student, uh, even non-traditional students who uh, maybe started college or uh, late or uh, they are starting a second career, um, we're interested. And so um, if we go to the next slide, yep, the eligibility, uh, like I said, is high school ninth grade up is really how I describe it. Uh, you do have to be a student. That's not just a Henrico County regulation. It's actually a federal regulation if you want to use the title intern, uh, but you, they are all paid uh, if you need college credit or high school credit we will also honor that as well. So it's almost like a two for two for for the student. But we also get the benefit of not ha um, of having. Um, an additional help during any time throughout the year. They're not just summer internships. We'll also do um, during winter breaks and spring breaks. Or our special projects come up. Um, but we also create a pipeline and start exposing our youth to the value of public service. And I know it's the greatest honor of my life to work for the community that's made me the woman I am today. And I uh, hope every day that we, we get a few more added to that 60 plus that become full-time interns. We post jobs, internships throughout the year. The bulk are in the summer, I will say, because they can be longer periods of time, but I still encourage uh, everybody to check throughout the year. HenricoJobs.com uh, has our listings, but then, I, like I said earlier, it's always good to have a person. So Debbie Lumpkin, who works in HR, is our internship coordinator, and she is happy to have informational interviews with potential interns to figure out what their interests are and where a good fit is if they're not ready necessarily to apply. So. Um, that is a brief overview. I hope I wasn't going too fast. I know it's a little late um, in, in the evening, so I'm happy to take any questions about internships now as well. Are there any questions for Carrie Tertina? Okay, we have one. Hey, Carrie, is the internship limited to Henrico County citizens? Uh, that is a great question. No, internships are not, uh, uh, resident specific by any means right now we have a returning intern in the manager's office who was a um, graduating high school senior at, in Hanover and uh, did such great work he reached back out this summer and we're having him back as he's a freshman at UVA so we just see the value of really keeping the students in our region in the region when they graduate it's very important for our labor pool for our businesses even if they just intern with henrico um, at one point in time uh, but then they move on to a business within somewhere in our region we're still proud of that because we kept them here and we got them some experience um, in central virginia well thank you very much carrie that was a great presentation and we we had people watching online and we had folks that were here in the in the, in the library public room um, want to thank too Megan Ryan for being here from the Virginia Coalition for Open Government and remember they are a nonprofit and um, I don't know if you can capture this and someone can um, use your iPhone and 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 find out oh have we got it all right, there we go. Can donate to the Virginia Coalition for Open Government to keep our sunshine laws working for us. So thank you very much this evening and I hope everybody learned something. I saw some of you taking notes. So thank you for coming and our next town hall meeting will be in September and it will be about the coming November bond referendum for Henrico County and we'll be talking about that. So thank you very much for coming this evening and have a good evening.